Hi, this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Next Tsunami podcast. This weekend, we're offering three conversations from episode 58, the beginning of our year-end wrap-up with Jorn, Louise, and me, plus from our vault, two conversations from season three, episode 20, Jorn's first episode as co-host. This conversation starts with me asking the team what each considers the highlight of 2022. We agree that one highlight was the return of in-person meetings, which gave Jorn a chance to reconnect with colleagues, and Louise and me a chance to meet everyone that has been part of the podcast since we started in 2020. 20, including each other. This led Jorn to hearken back to how the role of the podcast changed from during the pandemic, when it was quite possibly the only place for colleagues to participate in or experience regular conversations about pivotal medical issues, to today, when colleagues can meet fairly regularly at different locations, but still, there's regular interest and participation in the podcast. In fact, as I point out, download levels have risen dramatically since the end of the pandemic, which Jorn attributes to the explosion of knowledge about drugs, devices, and pathophysiology, and burgeoning discussions around guidelines and care pathways. Two more points in this discussion, the increasing globalization of our audience and an announcement from Louise that NICE is expected to approve FiberScan for primary care under specific circumstances. We covered that issue in two episodes earlier in the year. So we took a minute to discuss the history and the process by which NICE came to modify its initial position. As the conversation ends, Bjorn points out that FiberScan is not only a tool for detecting liver disease, but also provides patients with a way to improve liver health through knowledge and insight. In this context, Louise notes that FiberScan use in Australia is extremely late and limited, which may be one reason reason that NASH rates in Australia are at such a high level. Along with in-person meetings, your joining the podcast was our single biggest change this year. It was fascinating to me to compare where Nashville was when he joined back in April to what we all are thinking just seven months later. So sit back, listen, enjoy, learn. When you're done, join the conversations in our LinkedIn discussion group. It's been an eventful year on the podcast. We've had twice as many downloads by the end of this year as we had in the first 18 months of the podcast that entire time period. We've had some really great moments. We've, we've done a lot of fun things. I want to start by asking each of you what your highlight of the year has been. Louise Campbell. I suppose getting back to real conferences and for me it would have been the London Easel meeting which was the first big mainstream conference I suppose. Getting to meet all my fellow surfers in person throughout the last 12 months somewhere in the world and just having that dialogue in person. Person. Despite getting COVID following the easel meeting for all of these healthcare professionals that tell us twice a week. So that wasn't my highlight, but I, I didn't suffer. I suppose that was. So the, several highlights there, but mainly coming back to real meetings face to face. Jörn Schattenberg. Hey, well, the easel meeting was absolutely a highlight for the core podcast crew. Uh, at this time, I remember recording in a bathtub or something uh, similar, but I agree. I think that. Please let it be noted we were not all in the bathtub. <laughs> not at the same time, anyway. Uh, I, I mean, clearly the pair. The in-person meetings are great. Going back to the springtime, the meeting we organized in Barcelona was the first one in a row, and it's planned to be happening again last week of May in Barcelona. So that was the innovations of NAFLD Care, which I thought was a great start for a novel format. I mean, traveling international again, visiting ASLD and, and, and Washington clearly were, were highlights. And thinking back, I mean, we had lockdowns with travel restrictions and everything. It just seems we've come quite a ways, not quite a normality, but heading back to be able to interact and, and uh, that's important for the field that requires cooperation, exchange of ideas and face-to-face -face exchange to, to evolve for the best of our patients, I guess. Yeah, we agree on all that. I'm realizing that at this time last year, I had not been in the same room with either of you. I've been with each of you at least, well, Louis, what, twice, right? Barca and, and London, and then you're in four times, uh, Dublin and uh, DC as well, and have gotten to know everybody that we deal with on this podcast, which has been great. Also, Jorn became a permanent host at some point this year. We'll come back to that for his recollections in a moment, but that I think was a high spot. And I don't know about you guys, but the other thing I loved doing that was a pure podcast play was I loved the closing session of International Nash Day with Jeff McIntyre turning the tables on us, or turning tables at least on me, and him interviewing us. I thought that was a lot of fun and a different experience. Gave me a little bit of empathy for what people do when I own the microphone. And so I think all that was great. Let's go back to Jorn. Jorn, so this year you became a host. Yes. Just thinking back of the podcast and then and how this all started, it was in the beginning of COVID when we couldn't meet anymore. So my previous comment goes back to the importance to meet face-to-face. -face. So how could a podcast potentially make up for any of this personal interaction? Well, having set through it in the third season now with you, Louise and, and, and Roger, I have to say it is very stimulating, even as somebody who thinks about Nash, biomarkers, 
those endpoints in clinic every day to discuss this with experts that come in, bring in their very unique personal views. You know, people are asking me, how do you fit that into your schedule? I have to say it's enjoyable. It's uh, something I really look forward and it's a source of scientific exchange that I wouldn't want to miss even now uh, being back to face-to-face meetings. is something that's real um, with, a, with a podcast, uh, even in a shorter time. Sometimes you have more exchange and interactions with, uh, with colleagues. That's interesting. And one of the things I would not have predicted is that the download audience for this thing would have grown this year as much as it has because it really started to take off in the middle of the year, which was after live meetings had started again. I don't know that there's a correlation between that or just that it was things that were going on in Nash space, or maybe people were exposed to hearing more about it if they weren't KOLs or commercial people because they went to meetings and their friends said, gee, do you know about this? But for whatever reason, I don't know that I would have predicted that we had 40,000 downloads in our first 18 months. We'll have 80,000 downloads this year, plus minus, uh, which is crazy if you think about it. Well, there's incremental knowledge and things happening in the field for sure. The trials, the reportings are just, the density of the data is just very, uh, very high. And you cannot have as many meetings to cover all this. And that's where, from my perspective, the podcast fills in a big gap of unmet need to exchange on those results, to interpret a press release that's been coming out, to read between the lines and discuss this among experts. If you're working a pharma, you might get that through an ad board you have once or twice a year, but uh, the format offering it on a weekly basis with experts all around the world, that's something that's key for this podcast. And that's why I'm happy to be co-hosting it with you, Louise and Roger. And we're happy to have you. You've been, I think, a fantastic addition. Please note we're on audio. Louise is smiling and nodding as I say that. Just to follow on from Jean there, what I find unique about this, even when I'm not on the podcast, is the different views that come from different areas that you would never normally get in a room. Usually if it's a physician's meeting, it's a meeting of physicians. If it's a nurse's evening meeting, it's a meeting of nurses or dietetics. You don't tend to see in those meetings the breadth of discussion. And I think it's really important. What's been key for me, certainly this year, is the larger involvement that we get with patient groups from GLI to the Fatty Liver Foundation to Michael Bettel. And a great shout out to that session for primary care this week that they held. It brings in that. And we're seeing, certainly for me in Naffold and Nash, the strength of patients now being in the pathway and the centre of the pathway. That's certainly what I think we bring. And that's what I've enjoyed listening to when I've not been on the podcast. Wholeheartedly agree. As I'm listening to you, one of the things I'm thinking is when we started this podcast, virtually everything we talked about was drugs. Now, part of that is because of why we started it in the first place, which was to fill in holes about clinical trials in the pandemic. And part of it was, I think, Stephen's influence. And part of it was that there was a lot more to talk about. But then as we, A, we ran into a gap in trials because things slowed down in the pandemic and all of a sudden nobody was reporting very much. And then about the same time, the focus on guidelines and pathways took off. And then about the same time we met Donna. Well, we met Donna actually earlier on. So uh, I think for all those reasons, we've really broadened the scope of what we do. I was realizing we had Shira uh, Zelbasagi on the, in the last month, a dietitian. First time we'd ever done that. We uh, had the liver forum on. First time we'd ever done that. We had that fantastic interview with Marcus Rani at the end of Barcelona on biohacking. So I think we've really kind of broadened out this year, and it's been eye-opening for one thing. Did you have a favorite episode this year? To be fair, they're all favorites for all different reasons. But I enjoyed listening to the one that I wasn't on, which was the Fatty Liver Foundation's feedback, certainly from areas like 80% of patients still don't get enough information at diagnosis. And I'm hoping that's the sort of thing that we will change with the podcast. But for me, if I had to concentrate, it'd be where we're moving with non-invasive technologies, moving into being predictive of outcomes. We know we want to move beyond the biopsy, but how does that work in practice? Personally, with all of the in-face meetings that we've had, each time we get a stronger sense of the data coming out that most of the non-invasives can be used in a predictive format. For me, earlier in the pathway is good. And from a very positive sign, it now looks that the NICE are going to take that leap of faith and approve Fibroscan for all primary care physicians in the UK. As long as the patient is in a liver pathway and the predominant ones are NAFLD, hepatitis B and fibrosis over the age of 16. So it stays medical, but actually that'll be a great leap. And we've discussed that at least twice, if not three times on the podcast. And we are getting there. So I'm very encouraged by the advanced proof of that. 
that's out for consultation at the moment. So first of all, kudos to you and everyone at British Liver Trust and everyone else who, who worked so hard on this. We've had two episodes on it. We've talked about it a couple of other times in context, but I'm mindful that the first time we talked about it in March, it looked like there was just no chance this would happen, right? Yes, that was basically the way it all went in. It was originally, from memory, reviewed by radiology. Now, the one thing that Fibroscan gets confused with is a radiological test. It is not a radiological test, but because it's got scan in the title, it just gets pigeonholed. And I think that's probably not unique in the United Kingdom. So it's one of those things we had to re-educate that Fibroscan was a highly specialised test performed predominantly by nurse specialists and physicians in hepatology. So we had to take it out of its comfort zone. We had to take it out of its box and rewrite the pathway. But they have done a very good job with the committee and the British Liver Trust and everybody sitting there helping advise. And it's been a thorough process and it's gone backwards and forwards. So for those who will be looking at NICE to see how this is will be approved within the United Kingdom of follow-on suit, they're not necessarily focusing cost effectivity. They're focusing on how to do you early diagnose the many more patients with liver disease and liver fibrosis. And for me, probably the risk of metabolic health now within that by taking a leap of faith. And we just can't deal with that in an overwhelming way in hepatology. So I think this may be one of the first times that you will see NICE really do that. But to improve patient care and early diagnosis, I think this is a major step forward. And that should happen early next year. As I say, it's out for final consultation for a final week for people to comment on. That's a major breakthrough. And I have to say, I'm positively surprised to see this happening for the reason being that metabolic health, which is difficult to be identified. I mean, most people confuse it with obesity or the metabolic syndrome, which per se is not easily to define, is so easily detectable with a liver steatosis quantification. So whatever machine you have, if you use CAP, the sign that a CAP of 300 is there puts the patient in a box of metabolic disease. And if you follow them long enough and you do not change things, then these patients will have adverse outcomes. I'm very certain of that. Now, as uh, Louis said, it might be a leap of faith because we have not followed those patients for the last 30 years years based on their cap at baseline. We're just not that far in into that journey, but we know there's a good cross-sectional correlation. And if you change that, and it's changeable by lifestyle, by education, if you change that down the line, the expenses are going to be less by decreasing the incidence of diabetes is my prediction and also potentially improving liver health. But if you, if you move it away from liver health, I think assessing the metabolic health through liver fat, let's say qualification, is it fatty liver? Yes or no? I'm not even speaking about the quantity quantitative changes of this test. This is something where you can empower the patient and do something for their good. So I really like to see that. And I'm not sure we're there in Germany quite yet, but I think we can learn from the UK system. I think we would certainly generate data that will be able to look at that. I think predominantly it's still about fibrosis. But if I look here on what I've been doing in the last four weeks, I have a nice section of patients or people. These are just people, normal working populations. But to find a metabolic risk factor, I only have to scan four people to pick up a metabolic risk factor. So over 30% of everybody fit, healthy, working population has a metabolic risk. And I do it by the meta-analysis by Fibroscan. So you educate early, it's above 248. But yes, some have that. But if I look at stiffness, I need to Fibroscan 20. So depending on what you look and what you assess for, but not surprisingly, the majority the patients already with poor metabolic health by poor liver fat actually already had either type 2 diabetes, prediabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol. This is not available in Australia short of a pathway and it's not Medicare reciprocated unless you are in a liver centre. That is way too late to be looking at a population now that has 1.6 million diabetics and rising rapidly. For those who don't know, 1.6 million out of how many people in Australia right now? Um, Around about 30 million when I last looked, but they don't look at liver disease at all or poor liver health. It's a big number. And now back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. We'll be back next week with the next piece of our year-end review, this time including interviews with Scott Friedman and Donna Cryer, among others. You'll want to hear it. Until then, stay safe, surf on. We'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now. (laughs) 